Welcome to our spring release tasting and thank you for welcoming us into your home. I am Fraser, the marketing director here at Montelto and we'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Montelto acknowledges that we are located on the lands and waters of the Boonwurrung, Boonwurrung people, members of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We hope that you are all looking forward to a fun and informative evening tasting wine with us tonight. And with that, I hand you across to Ed and to Simon. Look forward to you from 2021. I mean, it sounds like it's going to be a crack of quite a lot of um, Victorian regions yeah. um, from, from what I've seen and from what I've heard so far, and, and certainly lots of stuff to come from you guys. Because you made uh, all the single vineyard Pinots in 2021. Yes, we did. Chardonnays and everything. So yeah. a really good range of wines to look forward to. But the first, of course, off the first cup of Frank is this Riesling. So first of all, just tell us where, where the grapes for this come from. Uh, our Riesling is about 1.4 acres, um, and it's just behind me on my right. Um, it was planted in 1990, and strangely when I arrived at Montalto, I, um, which was in 2009, and I looked around all the vineyards, and um, I spoke to John Mitchell, the owner, and I sort of casually suggested that we might pull the Riesling out. Um, having had a previous life in Mornington where Riesling probably struggled, and um, Ever since then, in the 12 years I've been working with that wine, it's always churned out amazing quality wine. Yeah, it's, it's strange that you should be the one wondering whether it should be, should be pulled out, because you're, you're a fan of Riesling, right? Oh, I'm 100%, yeah, yeah. absolutely. What, what is it that, that makes you such a, an advocate for it? I just think there's just beautiful aromatics. Um, I love wines that have brightness of acidity, and Riesling has that real... Um, you know, quenching, mouth-filling acidity, it's, it's tight, it sits well with food. It's a really versatile variety. You can make it in different ways and get different outcomes. Um, so yeah, just fantastic. Um, and what about, so 2020, you were telling me, um, sorry, 2021, you were telling me that, uh, look, you can't quite see, it's just out of shot at back here, but we've got the hill going upwards. Uh, I've got this kind of skinny rows coming down, a long way down the hill, Yeah. Uh, but right up the top, Bit of water, water be problem. They like Riesling too. Yeah, we we're lucky to have um, a be, be in a beautiful part of the world, and um, as part of that, we have to live with um, the wildlife. So we have a, a lovely family of wallabies that like to um, cross over the boundary and, and uh, nibble on our Riesling shoots. So yeah, we had a bit of issue there, and particularly the top of the block. So when it came to actually sampling. Um, a good part of the top of the block had lost crop. So, and typically when you're sampling, you're trying to get a representative look at the vineyard. So you'll, you'll try and take a bunch, maybe every 20 metres or something from a vine and bring it back to the winery and you'll, you'll squash it up and you'll test those grapes for, for flavour and look at the, um, the sugar and the acidity. And so that process became pretty difficult in 2021 in that block because trying to do something randomly when you know that most of the fruit is down the bottom of the hill relative to the top of the hill um, made that a challenge so um, when I actually sampled I found that what I thought was a particular ripeness actually arrived at the winery in a different um, yeah, different analysis. Right, so a little bit broker than would typically have been the case. Yeah, look, traditionally with the reason I've tried to make it more of a sort of classic Australian style. We pick it a bit earlier, so just real limey sort of drive and austerity. Probably, probably more like your classic Australian dry reason. Yeah, I've, I've had it a few times actually when I've come, when I've come here uh, as a sort of almost a, a, a courtesy you know, cleanser because it's got that lovely you know, tautness and that lovely uh, pure fruit and dry. Um, this year, I, I think the aromatics of, of this wine are, are gorgeous this year, um, as they always are, but a little bit more perhaps pushing into a more stony, fruity territory and slightly different floral, you know, plenty of blossom notes there, but a little bit softer perhaps. Um, yeah, it is. I, it's probably, it's, I think the extra ripeness has given it more texture and more structure and more mouthfeel and I see it's almost a bit more exotic yeah. I see more of the sort of Turkish delight quality and a, a bare boss of hair and um, you know it still has that sort of floral talpy thing happening um, but there's just there's more there's more stuffing in the wine and I think when you look at the palate there's more generosity and you can see the alcohol it actually gives it a bit more of a luscious mouthfeel um, and there's a phenolic presence that kind of gives it a framework and a structure as well so yeah the the distinctly different it's distinctly different from previous seasons um, and having um, reflected on what we've created in 2021 Hannah our other winemaker and I have wondered whether or not we should make two Rieslings moving forward um, because they're both legitimate styles yeah. 
and they serve a different purpose, particularly with food. So I think this sort of richer style is going to sit with you know dishes that are a bit fuller, um, whereas the sort of uh, the leaner style is going to sit with you know things like oysters and um, you know clean, bright sort of foods. Um, it's funny how you know things that weren't intended can actually turn out to be you know, really beneficial. But of course, the block is a, uh, it's only 1.4 acres. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, it's you know it, there's nothing wrong with the, the climate down here for, for turning out a really nice, pretty, and very, very drinkable wine. And yeah. so we have to be really vigilant and um, aware of what's happening on a daily basis. Yeah. So if we see a weather event coming, um, we're right onto it because um, I have seen the rain come in certain vintages and the Riesling can turn like in 12 hours. So if something happens, I'm usually on the phone to Dan Pryor, our vineyard manager, and I'm like, mate, we need to act and we need to act now. And, and he'll get a crew and, and, and we get it off. Yeah, I've got a feeling we'll, we'll be talking about picking a fair bit. I gather with the Riesling as well here, you have a particularly short That's window as well. We, you, I mean, the Wallabies and the misjudgment kind of made Well, apparently, it's, well, apparently the window's getting wider. <laughs> right, um, yeah. But yeah, look, most varieties, for me, like the, the most important thing with any variety is picking it when it has varietal definition and it actually looks the way it should look. It loses that varietal character and it falls into you know, more of a, a white, you know, a, a dry red wine category in the you know, context of red wine and kind of so a broader sort of nondescript almost um, character with white wine. So nailing that pick date is really important um, and it, it's also key for you know, alcohol balance, knowing about the, the acidity levels that are going to be in the wine. Um, yeah, so we, we're really careful, we sample a lot and um, we try and get our big dates right. Yeah, we've got a, a nice question here from Stephen. Um, he said, uh, has any of the um, Riesling had any time in barrel? Has it all come from stainless steel? Um, it's, it's, uh, traditionally it's always been stainless steel. Um, being a small vineyard and a small parcel, we usually whole bunch press and whole bunch pressing for me with Riesling it's been always about trying to limit extraction of phenolic, so to keep the purity and the brightness and the whole bunch kind of, it also limits the amount of um, rumbling the press and an oxidative sort of effect on the wine. So we're always looking, it's always handled in a much more anaerobic manner. Um, and that has been to try and maintain the maximum varietal definition and maintain the most purity that we can in, in the wine. Um, it's cold settled in tank, so basically when it comes out of the press it has some cloudiness and you'll we'll put it into tank and then over the course of a few days all the, the solids will precipitate out, end up in the bottom, then we'll decant the clear juice away. And then we'll add um, yeast and ferment it cold, um, and the idea of fermented cold, again, is about trying to maximise the, the purity and expression of the variety. So, coming back to your question, um, I do see Riesling as having, or barrels as having a legitimate place in Riesling, and Hannah and I have been talking about maybe introducing that. The challenge we have with our small block is it can be quite variable in its cropping level, and being a small, small um, vineyard, you know, sometimes we only end up with 300 kilos which was the case in 2020 yeah. um, so trying to do tank work and barrel work makes that pretty hard yeah. so unless we get a, a reasonable volume um, then we're kind of tied to a certain um, identification yeah. it. it's an interesting question but I would say as well uh, I mean for me a lot of what you can get from, uh, from the barrel work is actually that sort of breadth and that roundness um, and that sort of um, you know real, real settled nature to the wine um, but what I love about this is it's got that actually with that little bit of extra ripeness I feel that it's got that and of course you've got you know all the aromatics on show as well which I think is yeah look if I, if, nice. if I was to use oak I'm probably thinking more about building some texture and mouthfeel yep. because when you put a wine into oak you, you're probably going to um, lose some of the varietal expression um, so it's important, I mean, because Riesling is such a beautiful variety um, and has so much aromatic quality to it, we don't really want to uh, lose that at the expense of texture. So I'm always thoughtful about um, making sure that there's enough purity in the wine. Um, happy to have a bit of texture, um, but don't want to lose that purity. Um, okay, so next in line we've got the Pinot Gris. 
um, from Penton Hill, Elkrad Sam 2020. Now, we all know no one can remember anything that happened before the pandemic, so you're going to have to take us right back. What, what was, what's 2020? I mean, it would have been nuts anyway, because that was, you know, the onset around, you know, the news filtering through to what are we going to do with the vintage, um, I guess, with vintage hands ha as well and all that sort of stuff. It would have been a pretty crazy time in many ways. Um, tell us about 2020 from the winemaker's perspective. Well, 2020 started, um, it was always very cool. It was cold, it was an inclement weather, disease pressure always felt high from the beginning. Um, and leading into that flowering period, there was a lot of cold, wet weather, and um, consequently, fruit set um, was not great. So we ended up with minuscule yields. Um, and that's right across the board, the fruit set? That was across the board. Um, so normally where we'd probably do, it was probably about half. Um, and sometimes even less to what we would consider average. Um, and so, so we, we kind of we kind of knew or had this we're in this predicament where we we're going to have lower yields for the year. And then we approached December, um, and at the end of December, and the bushfires sort of started flaring up all across the country. And that's I, I've had experience in um, before Montalto in dealing with smoke tainted wine and so that was something that was on my radar and I was pretty nervous about. Um, and so there was a bit of jostling around January where we, with the, um, the local vineyard association got together and we talked about what might transpire and how we might deal with it. But fortunately, um, fortunately being on the peninsula we had um, wind moving in the right direction, so the smoke never sat here for long enough to become a problem for us. Yeah, and and travelling quite a long way. It was, and it was coming mostly from Gippsland, which um, smoke, um, as I'm told, has a half-life of about six hours. So by the time, after that six-hour period, all the phenols that are, um, can affect the, the quality of the fruit are lost into the atmosphere. So the smoke we did have here wasn't um, toxic enough to cause any, any damage. So. So we harvest got underway, we we're excited. We had some lovely weather after that cold period leading into Christmas. We ended up with some really mild weather. Um, the season ended up being um, two to, probably actually three to four weeks later than normal. Um, and I think that had this wonderful benefit of giving the vines um, the capacity to ripen the fruit um, physiologically. So it wasn't just um, wasn't just sugar accumulation. Um, it was also um, ripening of tannins, accumulation of flavours, and um, so it was a it was a fantastic outcome for us. We harvested early, um, got things in. Um, fruit quality was fantastic, and then we had this um, this COVID thing that jumped upon us, and we we're all pretty nervous about what might happen. We were bringing in all the hand pickers, so we'd have teams of 50 pickers who would come down, and um, we were worried about transmission of the virus. It was an unknown thing, so it was it was pretty nerve-wracking times and quite anxiety-inducing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, one of the great things that I've heard, I mean, from, from friends all over um, the world and from Europe and, um, and over here as well, was that one of the great benefits was that a lot of their, well, a lot of fans of theirs, so up in, over in Germany, there were smellios coming down to help with the, with the harvest and um, different people, you know, local people who were really interested in the winery got to help out because they kind of had to. And, and lots of families, in fact, really got together even more than they normally would with vintage and just had a different time of it. So I know that's not what you would have chosen, but I'm guessing you had a bit of a chance to get some of the winery the staff, or well, sorry, the, the restaurant staff and others a little bit more involved. Yeah, we did. Um, not not so much in the winery, but certainly after the harvest finished, yep. um, we were able to um, take all the front of house staff and some of and the back of house staff too, and we actually um, used them in the vineyard. Um, so we did a lot of our pruning, a lot of pulling out. And that was a wonderful experience for them because it, it gave them uh, an, a new appreciation for what actually yeah, happened. Of course, I think back to the table. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they, they, they have a bit of an ownership of particularly the twenty um, or the twenty twenty one vintage because they know that they've um, they've done the hard work to bring the vines yeah. up to the condition that they needed to be. Yeah. Um, and I'm guessing as well, after, let's not forget, it came off the back of 18 and 19. 18, which was, well, man, living here, right? it never felt like a warm year, but it was just not ever cold. So it was, it was just a warm and quite even vintage from memory. And then 19, which was a bit 
well, very different from that, but more characterises Warm. Yeah. But both of them pretty rushed, compressed, introduced with things right in at the same time. I guess Twitter Tony was complete opposite of that. It was. Um, yeah, it, especially 19 for me was pretty hot. And the wines present uh, very differently. They're, they're quite full and structured and juicy and powerful. Um, and you, then you move into a cooler vintage like 2020 and you see all this beautiful detail and this wonderful aromatic quality, just divine perfume in, in all the wines. And I think when you, I look through this lineup of 2020s, they're super expressive. Um, and they're, they're not the most powerful and structured wines that we've ever made, but they have so much detail and so much beauty about them and they, they, they just feel really complete. So, and I guess as a winemaker, I gravitate to that that more fragile, delicate sort of style with all the perfume, and I'd rather have that in spades over um, weight and heaviness. Yeah. Um, so coming into 2020 for me felt like coming home. Yeah, cool. And um, well, I've been saying about that about the um, you know that slow ripening um, and and how these you know the aromatics really showed. I mean, we're looking at Pinot Gris now, the 2020 uh, Pinot Hill Pinot Gris. Okay. Pinot Gris, of course. Not really classified, not classified as an aromatic grape variety yet. Over in its home in Alsace, it's sort of treated like the Chardonnay of the table with more for its weight than its aromatics. Yeah. Uh, but you've got something here that, of course, looks quite Alsatian, but almost ironically actually has more aroma perhaps than you'd, than you'd expect than from a typical Australian Pinot Gris. It's got really lovely lifted floral notes and a little bit more of that musky stuff going on. Lovely wine. Thank you. Uh, look, I, I agree. I, I think this is probably the best Pinot Gris we've ever made. Um, and I, it's it's those aromatics, because typically when I'm working with our Gris, it's, I find that I have to work really, really hard to capture and lock in the aromatic quality that is in the fruit. Um, whereas in 2020, it just it was just exploding with all this flavour and aroma, which um, is, I'm delighted that is really showing through in this. And the, the texture is an important thing too. So with our Pen and Hill um, Gris, I like to do between sort of 20 and 30 percent barrel work, and it sort of comes back when we're talking about the Riesling and yep. using barrels. So. The, the aromatic quality comes from using um, the whole bunch pressing straight to tank and we do a similar thing where we settle fruit um, to camp the clear wine away, add um, cultured yeast um, and then ferment cool and we, we capture all those um, aromatics. The barrel work component, it's all old oak, so we're, we're not searching for oak flavour because I don't want to smother the, um, the delicate flavours and aromas with oak. Um, I want to maintain the perfume but I'm searching for structural um, development and textural and mouth mouthfeel. So I find that with the tank component, um, if you drink it on its own, it just lacks a little bit of mid palate weight. So putting some of this barrel work and it just fleshes out the mid palate, gives it a bit more richness and kind of just builds the wine into this complete um, drink from start to finish. Yeah, and there's, there's been a bit of a change in in name here. So I believe that it's from memory, Grigio. Uh, 2018 was yeah, the right. last Grigio. Yeah. So that's not just a, a, a name thing, that's also a little bit of a stylistic you know, hint that you've got that mid palate weight. Well, how else do you define the, the difference between the Grigio and the Gris and, and what? Because typically, I guess, you know, more into it would probably be you'd see Gris on the label a lot more than Grigio now. Yeah, things. I think so. And I think um, that shift is probably because. Um, Gris is probably a bit more popular and there was probably a greater demand for it so um, we kind of just moved with the times and decided that was the direction we are going to take. Um, so so with, with, that, with the Grigio, um, I guess it, with Grigio you're picking it earlier so you're looking for an end alcohol of about 30%. And so when you're picking it early, you typically have higher natural acidity. So you end up with a wine that um, is softer, um, higher acid. Um, but you probably have more minerally flavours, more sort of nashy pear quality. When you let it get riper, you get more sort of anxious, exotic fruit, more texture, more mouthfeel. And the alcohol um, can actually give a, a sweetness and a warmth to the wine and um, gives more of a flesh to it. Um. Yeah, 
the other thing that, as you say, you probably say as well, there's a little bit of a different application to it, Victor Joe being a little bit more sort of crisp, refreshing, um, a bit more neutral, perhaps. Degree, obviously, here you've got lots of um, lots more flavour and a little bit more body to play with here, so probably yeah. richer foods sort of start, start to come into play. But yeah, I think it looks fantastic. We'll just uh, throw it over to Anthony to see if we've got any questions coming in on the Pinot Gris. Uh, we had we had a question about Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio and the differences, oh. but I think you've answered that one. Uh, um, well, the other thing I was going to say about Pinot Gris just before we move on was just um, obviously there's a another green in the range. Yes. Um, so what's the difference? You, you mentioned we're here we've got twenty or percent. I think you said you're going to barrel here. Yeah. Um, the majority being tank. So we've still got that. I suppose the profile of the wine still has that really nice, refreshing acidity. Not as crisp as a Grigio, but it's still got that. Uh, what, what, are, what are we doing with the estate? Um, well, the, the Montalto version of this is 100% barrel work, so um, it's it's whole bunch press straight to barrel, and and that that whole bunch component when it goes to barrel it actually has some solids in it. So when we were talking about um, putting things in the tank and then settling out the solids, um, by removing the solids, you, uh, as I said, you you increasing the likelihood of having uh, better varietal definition, better purity. By keeping the solids in there, you're actually giving um, the wine an opportunity to have funkier sort of qualities, more texture and more mouthfeel. Um, so our estate degree is all barrel fermented. It actually goes through mailer as well. So it's a bit of a winemaker's wine. You're kind of, it's, it's more work than, than this wine would be. So you're getting a lot more texture, a lot more mouthfeel and more body and it, it really becomes a bigger, fuller wine and it probably sits quite well with um, with richer sort of dishes. Um, well, as I said, looking, looking fantastic um, and, and you know, plenty of applications as well for that wine because of like, how it's turned out. Uh, onto the Chardonnay though, of course, a bit more of a Chardonnay bias overall in, in I think probably perhaps in your taste as well, but also in, in terms of how, how the many different uh, renditions of Chardonnay are made. I mean, Obviously, very, very popular and beautiful great variety. Tell us about what Pendant Hill is all about when it comes to Chardonnay. Pendant Hill is about being delicious, approachable, and just drinkable. Um, it's something that I just want people to be able to um, open up a bottle and enjoy um, any time of the week. It's it's not, it's, yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's a serious wine, but I also like to say that it's an approachable wine and you should just be happy to grab it at any time. It doesn't need a special occasion, it's just really drinkable. Um, as it is, I mean, generally speaking, I'm guessing that, again, as with the other, with the, with the, that, looking at a very bright, juicy year for this particular wine. Um, 2020, in fact, with Chardonnay's, 2020 was, um, it, it probably didn't, with the cooler season, it didn't probably give as much body or concentration as some of the warming years. So for me, they actually seem really soft and textural, but there's still we still like to have that bright sort of acidity, a little sort of lemony twist on, on the finish. Um, so they're, they're probably more hunter-friendly, pen, the, the pen and hill's probably more generous and softer than it probably is in, um, in the warmer years. Um, and there's just, again, it has that sort of real fine detail about it. Um, you can see there's a little oak twist in there, which yep. is um, part of the style. I think it's about... Four, oak twist, I'd say. Yeah, it's yeah, probably um, about 14% new oak in, um, in 20. Um, it's all barrel fermented, um, wild ferment. Um, we do, I do like to... I do like to pick early because it, it comes back to that whole thing we talked about with balance and um, having an alcohol in check. I find that if alcohol gets too high in Chardonnay, the warmth can overwhelm the fruit. And also on the peninsula, I find if you let things get too ripe, you can move out of um, the sort of citrus stone fruit territory and you can drift off into pineapple, yeah. poor, poor sort of areas, which is, I'm not a big fan of. So when I'm thinking about Chardonnay on the peninsula, I'm thinking um, citrus, a collage of citrus, you know, lemons, limes, tangerine, grapefruit, those sorts of things. And I also like to see a little bit of sort of white flesh stone fruit, so like white peach, yeah. white nectarine. Um, and when I pick at low sugar, to get the lower alcohol, they typically have high natural acidity. So we put all the Chardonnay through malolactic fermentation and that basically brings the, the acid level back into balance. Yeah. 
which is, I think, something that might surprise uh, some people in a way, um, because obviously it's, I think when people talk about uh, like, um, conversion, they often think of it as imparting a quote. It's been in really nice to be, but of course it's, you know, it's barely there in that respect. It's got a lovely softness to this. It's, yeah, it's, it's got a hell of a lot of really nice things to it, which I think I, I would say about all the years I've been yeah, look, I, I, I grew up in a, um, a food family. My dad had a restaurant, so from a very early age, I was um, uh, in the kitchen learning how to mix and match flavours and textures. And one of the key elements of um, of food or, or wine is the acidity and having a brightness and an energy on the palate just gives it a lift and a freshness. And I think it's really important when you're having eating food yeah. that you have this this um, position of um, of energy that you can then sort of pair back whatever food you just made. It's kind of a, you know, you have, have a rich fatty dish or something, yep. and then you can have a, a sip of wine that has a, a bright acidity and it kind of cleanses the palate and they kind of work, they bounce off one another. Yep. And I think when you look at those two wines, you'll see that this, it's almost like just turning the dial around a notch, but there's still similar similarities. I think that the perfume there is, um, there's still some similar qualities with mm -hmm. that sort of blood orange, and but there's probably a bit more blue and um, black fruit sort of sneaky in there. Structurally, I, I see the, the tannin significantly more in the, the estate. Um, it just, but the 2020 just has these really fine velvety tannins and it's just really plush and, and there's a generosity and a seamlessness to it um the, the pennon is just a bit lighter on its feet yeah just dances and yeah it's happy just just talking about tannin i mean picking we spoke about earlier the importance of that nailing that picking date but obviously tannin something that is right there in the fruit as you're looking at it um, that you're trying to capture but also something that you're probably quite mindful of making sure that you kind of represent that as beautifully as you can in the wine so what how does how does your approach in the vineyard and your approach in the winery go to making sure that those tannins you know are felt and t i guess tasted as well as as they are in a in a really beautifully turned out pinot it's one of the the struggles i've had as a winemaker tannins on the peninsula seem quite elusive. Mm -hmm. I'm never ever worried about over extraction with Pinot. Um, in fact, when I press, I'm happy to press pretty hard because I always find that um, having a bit of extra tannin around helps helps with the blend. And mm -hmm. I've never been able to press hard enough to find that I've had to find any Pinot, that it's been over extracted yep. or, or hard or astringent. So, um, you know, when I, when I taste Pinots from other regions, whether it's, you know, Burgundy or Tasmania or wherever, I can see that there's, um, the tannin profile is very, very different to what you get on Mornington. So I'm, I'm never fearful of overdoing it with tannin. In yeah. fact, I'm maybe fearful of not having enough. So, we, so we're mindful about um, skin contact time, and we like to get a cold soak in with the Pinots. Um, How many days would that typically be? Just like three well, or four days? Uh, it's probably... It can be sort of a bit longer, depending on the, what the temperature the fruit comes in. Yep. So, um, pretty much all the Pinot is wild fermented. So it's it's that time of between um, destemming into the fermenter and how long it takes the wild um, yeast to actually build up a sufficient population to get the fermentation underway. Mm -hmm. And if the ambient temperature is a bit colder, it might take a bit longer. So it could be between five and seven or eight days, and then it um, yeah takes off and, and sails along. And we're also, at the, and, and we're mindful to um, manage the cap um, when it's at peak fermentation. So we like to to get at least two plunges in a day um, during that that peak fermentation period. And then also at the end of fermentation, once that's finished, we will basically lock the fermenter up, um, and we'll, we could leave it there for you know at least seven days um so typically you'd see that the pinot would spend sort of three weeks on skins from start to finish and yep. by the end of that i think we've we've had enough extraction and um to, to get the sort of the structure we want yeah, yeah. and i'm assuming as well with we're talking about that uh, uh, tannin being elusive on the uh, peninsula i'm assuming that there's a little bit of that magic um that comes from vineyards like main ridge like merricks Chirong, and here where where you you're already feeling that tactile sensation in the fruit it's just got that little bit of x factor yeah 
so it's elusive because it's not just it's not your decision as well it's what the fruit's giving you yeah well you, you, yeah you the, you play the cards you dealt yeah. every year and sometimes they're not the what, what you want but uh, one thing i've learned as a winemaker is to um to yeah to actually play the cards you dealt and to be grateful for the cards you dealt and to try and mold that fruit to maximize the qualities that it that were contained within it yeah um, yeah, and you know, it's interesting when you talk about tannin because tannins across the vineyards are quite different. When I look at our main ridge vineyard, the tannins are, are quite grainy and quite big, but the fruit is always really delicate and it's kind of this weird juxtaposition of having this delicacy but with these grainy sort of powerfully structured tannins that are sort of meshing in with it. Yeah. And it's a f fascinating um, wine um, that comes from, from that particular vineyard. Um, whereas you move to, to somewhere like Merrick's and the tannins are always so sensuous and so supple and, mm. um, and plush and velvety. And so quite often having um, these blending components can really help build and um, form a, a wine and, and give it structure and integrity and a great framework and, and complexity and interest. Um, yeah, I know, and I have to say between those two wines as well, you can also you can both feel and I think... Um, on the palate and on the finish, you can feel the slightly more, I mean, you use the word sensuous to talk about the Merrick's tannins, but you've got a little bit more of that savory stuff coming in, I think a little bit more savory detail with the, with the Montalto Pinot Noir, yeah. but also a little bit more tannin, I don't know, but just kind of get under your skin a little bit more in a, in a really Moorish way. The, in fact, the tannins almost feel, when I use the word elusive, they almost feel like they're in there, but they're so composed and so beautiful and, and seamless. And, yeah. and I think that's just characteristic of 2020, because if I, look at the, if I look at the 2021 version of this and the 2019, it's, it presents it, it, it differently again. Yeah. And that's just a product of um, the vagaries of the indigenous. Yeah, I mean, certainly what we're looking at um, here, I think that 2020 shows, I think, pretty well that it, it wants to be wants to be out there doesn't it it's yeah. very bright it's yeah. very approachable but also the seriousness there but it's very very subtle very integrated um and i think that's that the beauty of 2020 is they they are drinking just superbly at the moment but i see them actually having with the acidity and the brightness and the fruit um content the, the concentration of it i see them actually aging quite well as well and ha still having a prettiness you know even sort of five eight years down the track, particularly yeah. without a state like the, the Montalto Pinot. Yes, we've got one question here about soil. Um, and is there a difference between Pennon Hill and Montalto in soil? Um, well, the Pennon the Pen Hill, um, well, both wines can come from any part of the peninsula. So typically the Pennon Hill, we're looking at um, wines that have been created or that have, have produced wines that are more delicate and reflective of the Pennon Hill style. So they're, they're lighter, they're quite aromatic and pure and pretty. Um, the Montalto wine is coming from, as I said, vineyards that have more depth and a bit more power. Um, so it's, it's, it's a difficult, it's, I can't really answer the question other than to say they're just, um, they're regional blends, so it's kind of, yeah. As, a, as, an, as an observation, I was going to say that, that it, it's interesting because Mornington Peninsula is an area where people talk a lot more, we talk a lot more about topography and the vagaries of really the hillsides and the pockets and the mesoclimate, the two bays and that sort of stuff, much more than we talk about soil. Generally speaking, I don't know, most people I speak to, uh, speak to just say that if the soil's, well, just as if it's good, friable soil, yeah. you know, then we're fine. And it's not necessarily a component that they feel has that much of an impact on the wine. It just... It enables the other things to work. Yeah, look, um, look to, to go back to that question, there, there, there is a defining feature of soil across the peninsula and the soils in Main Ridge and Red Hill, and Red Hill is called Red Hill because it is um, made from red volcanic clay. So Red Hill and Main Ridge, those red volcanic clays, they have a lot more water retention, a lot more nutrient status. So the vines are actually, they grow quite vigorously and you actually have to be more careful how you manage the canopy and that the canopy doesn't get too large and that you can keep it open so that you get airflow to reduce disease and um, and for the fruit to ripen well. Um, whereas when you move down the hill, you're moving into sort of sandy loams and so they're more free draining. And consequently, you have to be careful that if there's no rain around, that the vines don't suffer from um, not having enough water. Yep. And then they start to stress and so that, that can cause other problems. So. Um, and I think when, when we talked about earlier about the differences of uphill and downhill, um, 
with downhill sort of being a bit warmer and a bit bit heavier, more, more powerfully structured and more fragrant uphill, I think that probably goes to answering that question is that the soils do have an impact um, and, and that's, yeah. yeah, yeah, more structured down the hill, more fragile up the hill. Any other questions on the uh, PNA? If so... Oh, there was one more, just, <laughs> about, just about spice and, and someone noted that there's quite a bit of, sort of peppery spice character in these wines from this year and is that a feature that you you've noticed of the vintage or is that, um, where's that coming from? Yes, definitely 2020 has this, I, I call it a, like a pink peppercorn. Um, and that, that's a feature of the cooler, the cooler season. What I do associate with that sort of peppercorn note is that when I see that, you typically see a lot more sort of floral characteristics in the wine. And, um, and that to me is one of the absolute wonderful things of Pinot Noir. And if I can get some florals in my wine, mm. it, it really excites me. So, um, so yes, it, it's characteristic of the vintage and it's, I'm delighted that it's there because it brings with it other things. So, moving on to the Syrah. Now, I remember, <laughs> actually, I think I initially saw, not that I stalk you on Instagram, but I did see your note about how excited you were after tasting your 2020s, uh, probably a couple of months ago, um, and that the Syrah got special mention. Yeah, it did. Um, it, in fact, I, I, when when we sit there and we do our um, we do a, a benchmark tasting or something, um, which ha happens every now and again, I lined up all the 2020 Pinots and I threw uh, this guy on the end. And I don't think I've ever given one of my wines a 97 on the 100 point system, but I gave lots of 96s, but <laughs> lots of 96s. But I gave this one a 97, and it was for me this wine. It was just amazing it has it has red and blue and black fruit it has spice uh there's perfume there's depth there's layers there's structure it just it just seems such a complete wine and i, I can you know the, the our Syrah is always a really beautiful wine but there's something about the coolness of 2020 that has just brought the whole thing together yeah and strangely um, when you're talking about that pepper character you see in pinot I have seen pepper, more pepper in this wine in warmer years than I have in this year. I was going to say that, actually. And if I have a criticism of um, Mornington Shiraz, it sometimes it can be a little bit peppery and it kind of just tilts the balance a bit mm. too far. Whereas in 2020, I see that that is actually paired back, right back, and it's just harnessed beautifully. And there's so much more stuff happening all around that. Mm. I, mean, I was going to say the same thing. You'd think you'd expect from a cool area in a cool vintage, a, a real pepper bomb, um, potentially because you know it's always there in, in, in often a very attractive way in, in cool climates. Sarah, but here you've got so much, as you say, dominance from those. Yeah, real lovely blue, black. There's lovely florals as well to go with those. You know, the, the violets and sort of roses as well. But it's on the palate that fruit is so. There's something so gentle about it though as well. It looks so composed and it threads do itself really nicely as well. I mean, I, I can see why it would have really got you to sit up straight when you tasted this for the first time. It did, and, I, I'm, uh, and especially such a young wine as well. I mean, it's amazing how together it is. Yeah, well, we, we would normally not um, be showing our 2020 um, Syrah at the moment. It would probably be 12 months down the track. But as I said, with all the 2020s, they are so expressive and so approachable and drinkable now that we felt that they just need to be out there and to be enjoyed now because if, if we let them leave them 12 months um, some of that beauty won't be experienced yeah. so we just wanted to yeah get them out there get them in people's mouths and get them enjoying them but I, I still think this has the structure and the, the depth and layers to to let it age and I'm, I'd love, love to see this in 10 years time yeah. and I mean, you and I have spoken quite a bit before um, as we all do uh, in uh, in wine about the effects of climate the changes but um i know that you know we often have the conversation that that pinot noir is thriving at the moment um vintage year in year out it can surprise you as well and i and i think for me a lot of that what we talked about about all these little pockets these vineyards that have their little secrets they can always surprise you they don't do what you expect to do i mean as you said there was a lot more up the hill fruit in the cooler year because it performed so well which yes. sort of goes against what's uh, you know what your intuition would say 
Um, at the same time, I guess people will be asking, well, Syrah down here, or Shiraz, looks like it's got a pretty serious future because there's some lovely wines being made here. Again, with that really approachable softness, a bit of savoury there, but you know, just ripe fruit is just it's a delight to drink. Do you think, that, are you seeing a bit more talk about it or hearing a bit more chat and a bit, seeing a bit more planting? Well, I'm, I'm talking a lot about it. There's yeah. no doubt about that. Um, look, it's, 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 a, it's a lesser known variety on the peninsula, but I think it has a bright future um, because of the wines it can produce. And it, they're, they're not big, powerful styles. They're, they're not those riper, jammier sort of wines that you might associate with other Australian regions. Um, they are more medium bodied, um, more perfume shirazes. And, and for me, that speaks volumes to food. So, you know, we've got a restaurant here and the Piazza and having a wine of this ilk that's sitting on, a, on the wine list, um, just it's such a, a bonus. You can sit down and, and enjoy it with, um, with lots of different dishes without it swamping the food. So I think that's really, really key. Um, and, I, and I guess that I'm sure that there are plenty of people here who cut, cut their teeth on various Australian Shirazes. Maybe there are some that are just die-hard you know, Chardonnay and Pinot fans, but it's worth sort of talking just a little bit because you talked about how you approach Pinot. Yeah. With, with Shiraz, what, what are the things that you're playing with in terms of you know, looking out for in terms of ripeness, in terms of how you deal with skins, ripeness, um, tannin management and all that sort of stuff? Or is it quite a similar approach to... Um, yeah. I, Shiraz is probably, I find it a bit easier. Right. Um, I find Pinot is such a thin skin variety. And I find that the window of picking with Pinot is probably narrower and you know, tighter than probably with the Syrah. Um, so I... And, and getting, trying to harness Pinot is really hard work. Shiraz comes, you know, with thick skins, it's got heaps of tannin, it's got the colour. Um, so that hard work is already done for you. Mm. Um, you know, I've, I've done a bit of a whole bunch of work with Shiraz just to sort of try and understand the vineyards a bit better and what tools we've got at our disposal to sort of, you know, blend and create. Um, but really, for me, this is pretty straightforward winemaking. Yeah. Um, it's it's more about harnessing the beauty of the the variety. You know, even with oak, this is a, I'm using a lot less oak in um, the Syrah than than with Pinots, um, because I really love the beauty and the expressive quality of the Syrah. I, I don't want to um, swamp it with oak and overwhelm yeah. the fruit. Um, so yeah, it's just it's about sort of just letting it be yeah. and not tampering too much. It's not to say we're not you know tinkering in the background with things like whole bunch um trying to maybe understand it a bit better yeah i was going to say you so with um speaking of it with pinot noir um i'm guessing in 2020 there was a, a dialing back even more with a whole bunch of mostly de stemmed or, or entirely de stemmed pretty for those look ones, you, yeah typically i would use that whole bunch technique to combat a riper season yep um because i, I find that um the ripeness of the year can give really juicy uh, fruit and having some whole bunch can actually bring more aromatics and give it more of a savory line and it can bring a structural element too but it can the whole bunch can also give a little bit of a herbal green sort of quality um, from the stems and in a really warm year having some of that um, that greenery in there actually makes it it gives it more of a, a normal sort of vintage feel to it yeah um, so you'll see that these have sort of, I see a, a common theme in the 2020 pains of having like a, a fresh herb, like if you get some sage or something, you'll just tear some sage leaves and it has that real sort of fresh herb sort of quality. So knowing that it was a cool season, we, we moved back from whole bunch because if you, you then go and do whole bunch, you introduce more of that sort of quality to the wine, you're almost going to overwhelm it and put it more into a, a green sort of herbal vegetal territory. So you just need to be aware of what the season looks like. And how best to handle it. So 2020 was definitely very limited whole bunch work. Yeah, um, and again, and again, as you say, you, you've got all the perfume here and the Shiraz used to, or Syrah used to be Shiraz. Yeah. Again, like a bit like the Pinot Gris, Grigio Gris is it's got, yeah, well, got a little bit of an identity change, yeah, which well, makes total sense. Yes, I mean, this looks I mean, like nothing more like. Yeah. Um, <coughs> it couldn't look any more like cool climate. Um, so, you know, really elegant, silky Syrah if it tried. Well, I think, yeah, you've got drinkers out there who would hear the term sh Shiraz and expect it to be Barossa-like or McLaren Vale-like, and clearly this is not. Mm. So using the term Syrah just identifies it as being a more medium-bodied, um, spicy um, yeah, style of wine. Um, well, I love it. Is there uh, any questions, Anthony, on the Shiraz or anything else that we've covered so far tonight? Well, you've answered the question about Syrah and Shiraz. That was uh, coming through clearly. Um, 
there was another question there uh, just about um, you know cool climate and, and warm climate Sarah and how you see the difference um, well I, th I think the the cool climate styles you're seeing more I mean dare I say I hate using analogies and comparing to Mornington to other other regions or countries but if I'm I'm going to do it. Um, I see Mornington as being more of that Rhone style, um, more spice, uh, more earth, sort of more meaty sort of qualities. Um, if I, I'm thinking about hot or warm Australian climates, I'm thinking you know Barossa, McLaren Vale, and you're seeing riper, jammier, more blackberry, um, you know plum, and and traditionally those regions have used a lot more American oak. And we, we talked about the difference between American oak and French oak earlier, and American oak in that style lends itself quite well, well to those riper sorts of, um, of Shiraz. So um, yeah, I, I would just see that Mornington being more of a medium bodied spice and more perfume. And that probably probably plays a little bit into how you treat them with, with food as well. I mean, people tend to think of their, you know, their warmer climate Shiraz, not that it's a uh, Often, you know, you get that very soft tan in a lot of those wines, but at the same time, the, the heft, the body of the wine, the, the weight of the wine on your tongue is, is quite different from what, what you're feeling here. And I guess, I suppose the kind of foods you're talking about are a little bit similar, but you've got a lighter imprint, I feel, on the, on the palate here, which probably plays a different role as well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I look at that wine and there's more of a savoury line of the tannin, um, whereas I think about um, a bigger, riper Shiraz and it's more, the emphasis is more on sweet, juicy fruit. Mm. Um, and so they sit very differently with, with food. Um, and so I, when I think about Mornington as a wine producing area, I think about them, the, the styles and the varieties sing really well with food. And I think as time goes by, we're all sort of learning to be more, to make wines that are more food friendly. Um, which is really important and you know being associated with the restaurant every day when we're making the wine with, with the people who print the vineyards yes. yeah and they, exactly and right in front of the kitchen garden as well you know yeah. everything there's a big emphasis on you know doing everything um, locally sustainably um, and making sure that they work together there's harmony yeah well I have to say it's a beautiful place to be I'm, I'm really honored to have uh, been able to join you tonight Simon's Tessie's Wines thank you all those watching it for your patience at the beginning of the broadcast tonight obviously we're, we're very sorry about the uh, technical issues that we had but we hope that you have uh, enjoyed the wines we hope you've uh, gained a lot of insight from from Simon's expertise and generosity with sharing his experiences of those 2020 and 2021 yeah, vintages lots of exciting things to come out of them in the future Simon yeah, I think so. Um, 2021 is really exciting. I'm delighted with these wines, and 2021 looks amazing. And the vineyard guys have been out working hard. We've had a, a really good start to the season. The vines, um, I'm just looking behind here, and the vines look wonderful at the moment. The potential is just waiting to be harnessed yeah, for 2022. And like I said, people were back in the piazza yesterday, so there's life around again, which is great. And I hope that you get a chance to come and visit soon. Anyway, thanks again for joining us, and from us, good night. Thank you. Thank you.